Last time we were together, we discussed some of the features and technology behind the Therese Blue Water Series rods. Today, we're gonna to show you how we actually apply that technology to the troll style fishing here in the Northeast. Because we're not seeing anything visually, we got less than a quarter mile of visibility here. We're gonna deploy our spread about a mile out from where we think the fish have been and basically the information we've had up to date so far. Get some of that out here, cover some of the water between here and the spot, see if we can get some fish to come up. Because we're trolling out of a center console, we need to maximize our coverage more so than some of the larger boats that have a little bit more of an advantageous beam than we do. So to get more water coverage, we like to troll tracker style bars, bars that have these blades on the bottom that'll essentially spread the bars out further away from the boat overall. What that does is it keeps the baits visual outside of the white water behind the boat. So now you're in the strike zone with all of your baits instead of having half of your spread sitting there in that white water. We'll also try to cover those fine pieces of area in between the wash and the bars. And that's where lures like a cider chain like this one come into play. This doesn't have that same wide diamond pattern like a squid formation would have, like a bar does, but it has a string of these exciter birds all the way down that create a ton of agitation in the water with the furthest bait back having the stinger. The offshore world's a little different than the inshore world because you don't have structure. Usually the only thing that's attracting the fish out here is some kind of life, some kind of activity. So almost every one of these lures in the spread is designed to create a lot of commotion. That commotion creates a feeding type of frenzy or a scene on the surface, and that in turn should bring the fish. If you look at most offshore species, particularly tuna, their eyes are kind of situated more so on the top side of their head, because more often than not, they're feeding looking up. It's very rare to have a tuna come down and grab a bait underneath it. So almost all of the visual display here is designed to raise fish up from the bottom. Each tracker bar is labeled port and starboard because the planer has a direction of which way it's gonna pull it out. And we're just gonna set each bar up. The further you let them out, the wider that they're gonna go out. So we're gonna stagger them to get a, a wide spread behind the boat. So we need to cover this ground effectively. And to do that, we start off using these outriggers, which are gonna take the baits away from the boat and then deploy them straight back. There's two positions on the outriggers we have on this boat. So we're gonna be able to place two lines in this direction off this side of the boat, the starboard side, two off the port, and then we can fill in the space as we come into the inside of the boat using different rod positions and different lure styles. When you're placing a bait into a clip like this, you wanna make sure that it's almost as if it were the rod tip itself. So you want the line coming up that same direction. You don't wanna cross them back over itself and it's basically just an extension of the rod tip. There's a tension knob on the side that controls just how much pressure is against it. And you want it just enough to hold that bar there. Sometimes when you're deploying these, depending on the sea conditions, the clip will pop early, and that lets you know that you need to tighten it up a little. When you deploy this out, you need to back off on the lever drag on the reel to, to reduce some of the resistance against it, and then you can work it up the line. And as you'll see, this will create the point at which the boat pulls on this bait much further away from the boat itself. Lever drag reels offer a lot of different options when it comes to the amount of tension. You have a working free spool, you have a strike setting, and then a maximum drag setting. And you can adjust that with the drag tension knob when in free spool to be exactly where you want it and everything. But we generally will set these for strike. One of the most popular questions I get asked is what's the best speed to troll at? The truth is there really isn't a good answer for that. Generally, it could be as slow, and when we're talking about tuna specifically, it could be as slow as four and a half knots, could be as fast as seven and a half knots. What matters the most is every single boat has its own harmonics, its own signature, and its own amount of pull based on RPM and speed. What you wanna do is watch your spread, see the lures in the water, and where they look right, get them swimming correctly, then note your speed. As you note your speed, change directions every so often. When you alter your course to port, one half of your spread, particularly on the starboard side, actually speeds up. The port side will actually slow down. When you alter course in the opposite direction, you get the reciprocal effect. 
you may notice when you make one of those course corrections, you get a strike. When you do, if it happens to be on the slow side, then you know to titrate your speed to a slower setting overall. One of the less enjoyable parts of trolling, particularly in subtropical waters, is the presence of sargasso weed. While it might bring bait that brings a lot of life, it'll cling to a lot of your baits and it can reduce the efficiency or the attraction of that bait because it's got a big piece of salad dragging off it. So one of the parts you're gonna have to deal with regularly on the troll is to maintain and manage your spread and make sure you're not weeded. One of the most important things to pay attention to is the action on your rod tips. It's one of the nice things about having a rod that translates that kind of energy. It'll show you if your spread gets weeded up, reducing the inefficiency of your lures. Once you get a fish on, you want to clear the spread starting closest to farthest. This deep diver um, right in the middle of the spread is going to be our first problem to run in with once we get the fish close. So clearing everything as quick as possible once you get a fish on is really important. Key thing while that's happening is keeping tension on the fish. Whoever's on the rod, your most important job is making sure that that line is tight so that that hook stays buried in the fish. If you slack the line, once you've secured that first initial hook set, you kind of get a hole in the mouth and slack line, that hook can fall right out. So while the spread's being dealt with, you'll notice you kind of leave the boat in gear at first in case there's a chance for a multiple hookup. Once that's done, clear the spread, keep the boat just in gear to assist in keeping tension on the rod. One person on the rod keeps tension on the fish while the rest of the spread is dealt with before landing. This particular fish isn't a very large one, so it's not taking any drag, it's just keeping a kind of, if you look there, you can see his tail beating in the rod tip. While I'm reeling on the fish, I'm just using my thumb to guide the line onto the reel very evenly. Reels like Talica have an extremely fast gear ratio, so it's very easy to keep up with the fish. One turn of that handle brings in a significant amount of line. Oh, it's a baby bluefin. Little fella. We're not gaffing this fish because it's a short, we're just trying to get them off. There you go. We just released a fish. As we're setting back up, I put the boat a little faster than we would uh, be actually be trolling at. Just get everything out in time and keep the bars floating like Jack was talking about how they sink. Once I get everything set up right, I'm gonna back the speed down to exactly what we got that fish on, which is right about six knots, and uh, start trolling again. The reason we've switched to the 48 inch full roller heavy in the Therese Blue Water Series is because we're going to be using larger leader, larger line, and we actually have integrated a wind-on style swivel system. So instead of just fishing this bait on monofilament, we have the advantage of using fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon is better abrasion resistance, and it actually has a similar refractive index to salt water. So it's not going to bend waves of light. It's a little bit less conspicuous to larger game fish with big eyes like tuna. Uh, this bait in particular, we're going to fish shotgun in the spread, which means long and down the middle on the way back. So now I've got to swim this bait through the spread. We have our outriggers with our spreader bars out to the side. We have an exciter chain on this side, and we have a diving bait here. Uh, to get things through a little easier, I'm going to start off on the outside of the dive bait. One of the big advantages of the 48 inch full roller series is it has these large Winthrop roller guides, which are beautiful for accommodating these large inline swivels that we like to use. This inline swivel system is connecting our monofilament top shot to our fluorocarbon leader. We got a nice long fluorocarbon leader here to maximize the visibility of that bait and give us a little bit of chafe protection, not only for a large tuna's tail or their body, but also in case a billfish were to come up and attack this bait. So we're fishing about 130 pound class fluorocarbon leader on here. You'll notice that we don't use any chafe gear and that's because these swivels are machined so perfectly that there is no point of chafe with any of the contact on here, which is nice so it reduces the profile coming on and off the guides. You'll see here that our top shot, the monofilament leader, is now married to a significantly larger capacity of braided line. And that's done via a splice. 
This is Ho Power Pro Hollow Ace Hollow Core line. It's a 16 carrier line that you can serve leader material up into, and it'll create a Chinese finger trap style connection. And what we do to prevent slippage on that is a whip finish or a serve. You can use a basic whip, you can use a PR bobbin, even an FG with the tag end there will work very well. And now that will transition this monofilament top shot to our braided line, which lets us know about how far back it is behind the boat. How big are your top shots on these, about 150? 100 yards. Yeah, yeah about 100 yards. So now we know this bait's about 100 yards behind the boat. Fish were reacting to the bright colors. Had one knocked on on the port outrigger, missed that fish, and then the shotgun long went off. Single bait, skirted. I think it's a nicer yellow. I'm glad it hit this one because we put that larger bait aimed at catching some of the larger fish on the shotgun. So we went with one of the heavy model Therese Blue Water Series in the 48 inch full roller. Match that up with the TAC 50. It's gonna give us a lot more control over this fish, a lot more lifting power. You can see even over here trying to avoid the engines and putting an angle on the rod lifting, I'm not getting any roll or any flex in the tip. That's that high power X working. And that nice even bend, that forgiving UD glass blank inside there, matched up with the Spiral X is giving me a lot more lift for the amount of effort I'm putting in. As this fish is spiraling up, I'm keeping the motors turned and just slowly uh, copying his circle so he stays 45 degrees off this corner. Collar, we got collar. Teamwork is everything with these pelagic fish. It's nice having the integrated system where you can wind on a leader. Some of the other options, you've got to have a swivel on there. One person, especially if you've got the right guy in the boat, has to grab that bait, pull it up out of the water, and leader the fish to the gaff man. But in this case, we were able to wind that swivel right onto the guide, bring the fish right to the tip, and Max was able to secure a solid gaff.